Thank you guys. I think I got used to it and now I feel like I'm all leading up to you. Well, now sometimes they bypass that. I don't know. Oh, and you're not. Just click on this and erase it. First off, thank you so much for coming out today. I'm really excited that there's so many people here that want to talk about outcomes assessment and crimes assist. Oh, is that what they should be so my name is Amy Gustafson. I'm the Assistant Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Research. Uh, I am here to talk about assessment today because this is something I really, really love. I have written peer-reviewed articles about assessment. I have presented around the state about this. And it's something I'm hoping that you will be as excited about as I am. Because that entire idea of you know, gathering information in order to make improvements for my area. So, so I didn't provide that on the wall today. Let's stay that way. Okay, hey, I'm quite wondering why did I ask you all to make Play Doh animals when you first came in? <laughs> well, first off, um, it is the exact opposite of what most people think about when they think about assessment. You know, Play Doh is fun, right? Uh, and when I gave you these instructions, I gave you There's the very. Thing on the going to play no animal. If I would have been more specific, if I would have given you better outcomes, you might have made a better creation, possibly. And that's one of the things we're talking about today, are outcomes. And so, uh, in addition to that, if you are an instructional uh, person, if you teach, uh, you will discover that you know the more directions you give students, they will give you a better. And Do what? Um, there's another version of this where you can just click on it from your desktop. Oh. Um, so, so that this is about assessment, writing outcomes, and then using the The good news is, is the assessment and writing outcomes. You can teach me. Okay, so our session outcomes. We can't talk about outcomes without having our own four sessions. So, as a result of this session, attendees will be able to explain the importance of assessment, construct a student learning outcome, a service area outcome, or an administrative outcome. Um, and I should stop right here and mention, we have a lot of different folks in this room and people that are watching from their computers today. We have ECD folks that are watching from their computers. We have uh, faculty members and then we have staff. So, and people are at different levels of using compliance assist and doing assessment. We have folks who are just starting out, and we have folks who have probably been doing this for years and could stand up here and do a lot of this presentation. So some things will be basic, but some things will be new this year. And last, you should be able to complete your annual program planning and review report, report which is I'm sure why you all are here. Okay, so topic one, assessment. So why is assessment important? There are a lot of reasons why assessment is important, but something that's important right now is what's happening with our reaffirmation and SAC COC. So I'm sure you all know that we are in the reaffirmation class of 2018, which means we need to get our compliance certification report to SAC COC by March 1st, 2017. So that's less than a year away, so maybe 11 months at this point. Okay, so when SAC COC talks to us about assessment, they have one standard, they actually have a few standards that talk about assessment. But for 331, this is basically saying that the institution will identify expected outcomes, um, ass assess the extent to which the institutions achieve those outcomes, and then they will make improvement based off of those results. Okay, so this is very broad, but what's interesting, if you guys can see one, two, three, and four right here, so three, three, one, one, this talks about educational programs. So this is its own standard that just talks about what we have to do with outcomes and assessment for instructors. The next two are administrative support services and then academic and student support services. So these are our service area folks and our administrators that we have to focus on for these two um, standards. And then last, ECD is covered in this community and public service um, assessment. So we do have to be thinking about the big picture as far as the entire college goes. Okay. So we talked about why assessment is important as far as SAC COC goes, but there are a lot of reasons why assessment is important other than that. 
So assessment is a kind of action research that informs local action. It will provide you an instrument for improvement, data for change, and a basis for wiser planning, budgeting, changes in curriculum, pedagogy, staffing, um, and student support. All of these things are very, very important. And when I think about assessment, and the reason why I love closing the loop, it's this. And of course, what we do for SACS is so important, but really, this is what you want to be doing every day. And the good news is, you all are probably doing this already. Because unless you're growing and adapting in your program, there's no way you're going to stay relevant anymore. And so, for example, we have this 1960s mainframe right here. And you know, if we just stayed here as far as technology goes, we wouldn't be moving forward. But we know that we've done so much more since then, uh, and we have these fantastic devices that we can use in the palm of our hands. So it's the same thing for y'all's programs. You're always changing. And I know with the healthcare programs, they have to change in order to keep up with what's needed in their industry. And that's wonderful for us because we benefit from the improvements in the healthcare system. Okay, so we talked about why is assessment important, but we haven't talked about what assessment is. And I feel like I should just say this before we move forward. So assessment is the systematic collection, review, and use of information about educational programs undertaken for the purpose of improving student learning and development. Okay. And so we know we're a learning first college. That's what CCCC is. That's what our mission and our goals say. So it means that everyone on this campus has uh, a hand in making sure that students are important and that learning first is what we're focusing on for outcomes and assessment. Okay, so Folks, I have read a lot of different methods for the how to think about assessment and how to think about the assessment cycle. But I really wanted to keep it basic today and just think about the three steps because that's really all you need. So the first thing is to which is to create an outcome. So you're trying to think about what do I want my service area to do? What do I want my students to do by the time they graduate and walk across the stage? Next, after you've established your outcomes, you need to gather your evidence. So are your students able to meet the objectives you're looking for? Is your service area able to meet the objectives? And then last, you need to use the data for improvement. Now, it's really easy to create outcomes and to gather evidence, but one of the harder parts is to actually use that data for improvement. This is what we talk about all the time over here, and you can't see it, but right here it says closing the loop. Um, so what we need you all to do, especially this year, is recording. We are recording in March of 2017. We need you to gather this data and actually use it for improvement. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So some key points to remember when you're thinking about uh, doing assessment and outcomes at CCCC. So IER, we look at a few things. And the first two items really focus on instructional programs, so let me talk about this first. The first item is student learning outcomes assessment. <coughs> there are a thousand ways that you can do assessment. You can assess the happiness of everyone in this room. You can assess their hunger. You can assess the facilities. There's a lot of different ways you can do assessment. But what we're looking at for this, for instructional programs, are student learning outcomes. What can they do when they walk across that stage? That's what really it's a promise we're making to the community, that our students can do these things when they leave CCCC. The next thing we're looking at for instructional programs is program level assessment. So we assess all day, every day in classrooms. But program level, again, once again, is what can they do once they leave? And the last item is continuous improvement. And this is something that everyone is working on every year because this is an annual project. So we're collecting the data, we're, excuse me, we're building the outcomes, we're collecting data, we're analyzing it, and then we're reflectively making improvements and continuing that cycle. Okay, so I'm going to send this PowerPoint out to you guys, so I'm not going to spend as much time on the next slide. I just do want to mention a few things, especially for instructors in the room and program directors and department chairs. There are a number of different ways that you can do program level assessment. So one of the, my favorite ways, and this is uh, one of the ways that the um, AA program 
is something that AA program is doing. That is capstone writing assignments with a rubric. Um, rubrics are a great way to establish criteria of what you expect from a student. And I have a feeling that a lot of you all are already using rubrics already, and it makes it easy for grading across instructors and grading different assignments. So what you're basically saying is establishing criteria of what you want um, when it comes to their writing assignments. Um, from there, you can see that there's a goal of 70% of students will get a three out of four or better. And this is something that's actually been directly lifted from a compliance assist page. This is something that um, the AA program is actually using. Next, the AS program are using lab assignments, and their goal is to use 80% or better as far as um, what the students will achieve. Next, um, this is one of my favorite ones, and I'm uh, really sad that Carl Bryan is not here today, but um, that is the personal wellness plan. If you all have not heard about this, it's fascinating. Students uh, exercise and develop their own wellness plan for themselves, and they spend an entire semester re reflecting on their own health in order to improve it going forward. And they have an entire rubric that goes along with this, and it's just like, such an exciting uh, assignment they have to do. And for that one, is 80% of students will score, um, or 80, the goal is 80% or better for all students. Next, uh, there are 16 question assessment pre and post tests, and this is something that the AS department is doing, so university transfer. And so the idea is that students will score an 80% or better. Um, or 80% of students will score a 75% or better on the post-test. So they'll get the exact same test in the beginning as they do at the end. And you can kind of see their growth throughout the entire program. And so that's a really interesting way to do assessment because usually we think about, I'm just going to look at this one class and I'm just going to assess this way. But that's a much bigger global way of doing assessment. Um, from there, there are oral presentations that use rubrics, and I know that's popular with the English classes. And then last, especially with the health sciences, are the national um, and the North Carolina licensing exams. Because of course, we want our students to be able to pass those things so they can go out into their professions and actually practice. And so for that, we have 90% of students will pass an exam with a 75% or better. Okay. And this is the caution I want to give all of the instructors in the room. So I've had questions about people using exams for their student, le student learning outcomes assessment for this process in compliance assist. And my warning for that is you can use an exam if the entire exam covers the content or the learning outcome that you're looking at. But if only one question or two questions covered on an exam, that's not something that you would want to use. And this is something that we heard from SAC COC reviewers that when we, when we went to uh, the SAC COC meeting in December. And some reviewers don't want exams to be used at all for student learning outcomes assessment because they just feel like there are better ways of, of doing that. Do I have any questions about that? So are you saying like for their licensure exam results not to use those is our learning timeout. Oh, no, that's fine. But okay. yeah. you're talking about in class exams. Yeah. Gotcha. So if you had one class, one exam, like halfway through the semester, and you're only using like two or three questions from that exam, that's not enough, that's not a big enough picture to prove that when they walk across the stage, they can actually do those things. And so that's why it's, yeah. It's a little Any other thoughts on this? But you're talking a, um, a written exam. I do a practical exam. I, yeah, I think that would be fine because it's like demonstrating skills. Uh, so it's a little bit different. What I have seen is at least a few times this year I've seen uh, two questions on exam where it's multiple choice and they just answer that one multiple choice and that is not enough to say that they know that entire body of information. So let's get on. Okay, so writing outcomes. I'm sure most of the folks in this room have written outcomes before, but we'll just go over it again briefly. Okay, so outcomes should be concise. They should contain an action verb. They should have a measurable result. And especially if you're doing service area outcomes assessment, you want to use a SMART goal. So 
Next, we're going to look at a student learning outcomes Mad Libs edition. So basically, you can format all of your outcomes like this and just fill in the blanks because it's already there, up there for you. So for this student learning outcome, as a result of the blank program, students will be able to action verb and then whatever concept you want them to know. So they'll be able to demonstrate, they will be able to, um, uh, let's see, synthesize. They will be doing, able to do a lot of things with that action verb. And we're going to look at a very long list of action verbs in just a second using Bloom's taxonomy. And I, I have a feeling it's familiar for a lot of y'all, but I just want to make sure. Okay, so this is your basic skeleton structure of your SLO. As a result of the blank, students will be able to blank and then this concept of action verb. Next, uh, it's not just a matter of making the outcomes, you actually have to make it measurable. So you don't have to write it this way because we have it broken out with lines assist for you very easily, very uh, in a nice format. So it's, this measure is, this concept will be measured by what method during the blank semester during a certain time period. So are you going to do something every semester? Are you going to do it once a year? Are you going to do it uh, less than that? Or yeah, but I, my hope is is that you all at least assess everything once a year because that's why we're doing this on an annual basis. And then you also have to create your own benchmark. So the benchmark is blank percent or better. Uh, and usually what we want to see is at least 80% uh, just because, you know, that's a nice green. That's a good place to strive for students and for starting the area. Next, so you can use this exact same format when you're writing service area outcomes. So as a result of the whatever um, project that you're doing, students, faculty, staff, something that's blank will be able to action verb and then whatever concept you're looking at. Okay, and the reason I have one, two, three here is that at least three outcomes in compliance assist are required by IDR, uh, but is really up to your dean or your vice president, whoever reviews your page. They will determine if they want you to have three outcomes or six outcomes, but at, at the very least three. Okay, we want to talk a lot about Bloom's taxonomy. Actually, I'm really curious. Raise your hand if you use Bloom's taxonomy before. Okay, so Bloom's taxonomy is just this basic triangle of learning. At the very bottom, you have knowledge, which is your basis of learning. And you continue to get more um, advanced as you move up the triangle. So at the very end, you can do evaluation and something like synthesis. So at this point, knowledge is basically, can I spit back these facts to you? And synthesis, when you get to the very top, is uh, can you think broadly over the last two years, take all the information you have in order to maybe help someone in the health professions? Uh, for example, I mean, that's pretty important. You want them to be able to assess your vitals and help talk to doctors and, and get you healthy. Okay. So with the Bloom's taxonomy triangle, you do have all these different action verbs that go with it. So you can, in order to analyze, you can diagram, you can outline, you can point out, you can prioritize, okay? So this is less, um, uh, in depth, and then when you get down here to synthesizing and evaluating, this is um, more advanced. And this is the area that we really want you all to think about, because once again, it's that walking across the stage, what can they do when they graduate? Okay, right, so do you guys have any questions about writing outcomes? Okay, great. So let's go ahead and talk about compliance assist. Before we do, I have some handouts for you all. We'll talk about these handouts before we get into compliance assist. And then you might help me pass this out. Are compliance assist hacks. These are suggestions given to me by other reviewers and by other uh, folks who report in compliance assist. I thought these were really great suggestions, so I just wanted to mention a few of these. So the first one is 
uh, we hope you're able to log in to Compliance Assist. If you have forgotten your login or your password from last year, please contact me. Don't worry, it happens all the time. I'm happy to reset that for you. Uh, the next one that I thought was a pretty interesting suggestion is that um, working in Compliance Assist and doing outcomes and assessment really requires a mindset change. So you folks are probably the busiest folks on campus, right? You are, you know, taking care of all the people in your department, addressing all these things that you need to do. I mean, you have a lot going on. So this person suggested that we move from, you know, all the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, like putting out fires, to being able to think about the big picture in doing outcomes and assessment. And I know that can be really challenging, because this is a really busy time of year, but I thought that was a good suggestion. Next is the reporting process. Think about gathering information starting now. Just because some nine-month staff leave or faculty leave in the middle of May, I mean, you might not be able to get in touch with them if you ask for this information later. Like, if they have the data you need and they're walking out the door, you're not going to be able to get that. Sometimes people go on vacation, things like that, so maybe start now. Um, consider glancing at your outcomes from this year and last year, just so you can be thinking about them in the back of your head before you ever sit down to write anything. Uh, so when you sit down to write, it'll make life much easier. Then last, consider sharing your data with your department and your advisory committee. I know the AA program does a really good job of taking all the data they found, they sit down with every faculty member in their department, and then they determine how are we going to close the loop as a team? How are we going to improve student learning together? And I know that's something that the library does as well. And so it's just a matter of uh, making that happen. And then last, I'm not going to read these out to you all, but there are some interesting thoughts from um, a dean, from a VP, and from a program um, uh, department chair about using compliance assist and ways that they conceptualize it. On the back of the sheet, we just have those important links about getting started. There is a four minute video that we created using compliance assist. So if you forget what we've done here today, you can go to that website and learn how to get around everywhere. So that's, that's very helpful. And then last, you can see what timeline we have for everyone reporting for their annual review. And then last, reviewer feedback to you guys will be done in late summer, and we'll have more dates on that coming soon. Any questions about this data? Okay, so let's go ahead and actually look at Compliance Assist. So the first thing I want to mention is that you can get to Compliance Assist from the internet. So if you go to the internet on the left-hand side, that's where the Compliance Assist link is. Also, you can get there by going to the IE webpage, but it's pretty easy. It's ccc.compliance-assist.com. Okay, and remember that the Compliance Assist login is separate from your CC email and password. So uh, it's possible that your, your password is the same, but it's possible it's not. So if it doesn't match up, just send me an email. Uh, from there, we do have a suggestion of using Firefox or Chrome. We have a very sad incident where someone is using Internet Explorer um, to put in their Compliance Assist information. And compliance or in Internet Explorer did something strange and they lost all of their information. So you might want to put your what you're planning to write in a Word document before you go to Compliance Assist. And then also Chrome seems to work the best, at least for me. I know there are some copy and pasting issues with my box. Okay, so with all of that in mind, let's go ahead and look at Compliance Assist. Apparently it remembers me. Okay, so the first thing that you see when you log in is Dr. Martin smiling at you, welcoming you to Compliance Assist. <laughs> From there, there's just a reminder to use Firefox or Chrome when you're using Compliance Assist. Okay, so the next thing you'll want to notice is over here on the left hand side, we have available websites. And since I I'm an IE, I have all of these, but I'm pretty sure most of you all will only see program review when you go in here. And that's what you're going to need to use for the annual review. So let's head to program review. And then from here you have a welcome 
and my contact information. So once again, if you can't spell Gustafson, which I don't blame you because it's like the hardest last name ever, um, you can come here and just click on it or get my phone number. Over here on the left-hand side, you have information about outcomes and assessment, which you all can read. And then last, we do have that reporting calendar. So if you misplace the compliance assist hacks that we handed out, all of those same due dates are in here, the annual review. And then it has information about the end of cycle report, which is basically three sets of annual reviews being reviewed at one time. And that's due on October 30th, on October 31st. And if you're one of the lucky folks this year, we'll be contacting you uh, in mid to late summer about that. Is there any way to deviate from those due dates? That is an excellent request. <laughs> um, <laughs> Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, I know in the summer, us department chairs were given the time to do those, to do the compliance assist, and it's due two weeks after the summer's, you know, after we finish fall semester. So we don't have, but we have two weeks after, you know, it's due May 31st, so where we should have had time throughout the summer to do our compliance assist instead of it didn't the the top grid didn't make the cut. Oh, this so top? Yes, it did. Well, yeah, Whoa. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thank you for you for you. <laughs> Very good. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Dean Bynes came in South yes. August. Well, I turned five. around and looked at it when I saw the things, <laughs> and I'm like, I know you knew I was up but I was fast, and I didn't see it at top. So. I got it. I got thank you, thank you. <laughs> so all thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, the, the May 31st, we, <laughs> Linda and Stormy and I were talking, I don't think we made the cut, but that May 31st, they're talking to change that fall to June 31st. Okay. That is wonderful. So excellent news that for all excellent. faculty members. <laughs> it is now to August 30th. How about nine months faculty, Brian? That's, I've got an email that's going out this afternoon. Okay. Excellent. See it? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. you know, I think uh, all the partner chairs will be happy. Okay, so I'm going to head back to the home page right there. And I realize that some of you all might not have signed in yet because we have additional folks. So we'll send that around on this side and then we'll send this uh, sign sheet in around over here. Okay, so just to get you acclimated again, remember we are on the program review page right now and it's that main page. And we are just looking at the reporting calendar over there on the left hand side. So now we're gonna go to this red bar to get where we need to go. And so for the drop down, you will drop down and choose whatever area you're in. So if you're in instructional programs, you'll click on that. Service areas, economic and community development, executive leadership, or dean. You all have your own set of pages. So today what I've done is I'm headed to instructional programs. I've actually created a hybrid page that has examples of all three areas all in one. So we can look at those of the group. So I'm gonna head to the CA example. Better? Okay. Okay, so across the top of this page, you can see all the different tabs we have going on. And just to, this looks a little bit different than most of your pages do. So the first two tabs, this is related to instructional programs. The next two are related to service areas. The third set are ECD. And then from there, you have your document directory and end of cycle program review. So as far as the program profile, which is that first one for each of the sets, this is just the basic information about your program. So it's got the name, any program codes that you have, your reporting year. So if it was in 2013, 2014, you'd probably be doing your assessment in 2016, 2017 for your end of cycle review. You have your dean and you have your personal reporting. Now this is really important because I know people change on campus all the time, but if you have a person that's changing as far as reporting goes, let us know in addition to updating this because we want to make sure that we send out the emails to the right people um, so they know that what's going on with compliance assist. Uh, from there, you just have some more information about what degrees are awarded for instructional programs and then the mission statement and the program description. 
Uh, when you're using compliance assist, it's a good idea to notice where the blue areas are because those are the areas that we want you all as reporters to type in. All the areas in white, those are things that we'll fill out for you um, in IER. And just, okay, so it's not happy with my flash, okay. So we'll head back and just look at the service area profile, which is very similar, but a little bit shorter. So we're borrowing the admission counseling one for service areas, and they just have a brief description that they need. So not as much as related to degrees and credentials here. For ECB, theirs is also fairly short. They have continuing education information, uh, who's reporting, what their mission is, and the program should be there. Also, if you have any type of professional program accreditation or instructional accreditation, you'll want to include that in here. So the process is, has it been approved? Have you applied? The status is, um, yes, uh, we are accredited. No, we're not. Or we are, are in process. So you can include all of that information down there. So from here, we're going to head to service area outcomes, and we are going to look at what the page looks like. So we have everything divided out into sections, and for service areas, it's uh, service area information is first. Next are the outcomes, the service area outcomes for that area. The third section is quality and viability. The fourth are accomplishments and innovations. Fifth is facilities. Sixth is budget request. And so let's briefly compare that to the other two before we start talking in this area. So it's pretty much the same for instructional programs. You have program outcomes, you have, but for them they have student learning outcomes that add to it. And you'll see for instructional programs the quality and viability criteria is much longer. They have much more uh, to include in there. But then they also have the accomplishments and innovations budget and the program review assessment. And then it's just the same thing for um, ECD. Most ECD pages will not have student learning outcomes, but the one that we borrowed, they actually do have student learning outcomes. So we're headed to service area outcomes, and we're going to go to service area admissions and goals. And so you see, uh, in order to orient you to what you want to do, you are looking at the mission of the college and the goals of the college. And this is the 2013-14 one, so it's not updated with the new so first thing we want you to do is to include your service area mission that appeared on that profile page here. And then from there, you'll include all the X's all the way across for how you support CCCC's goals. And then from there, you'll give a short description about how your mission supports institutional goals. You don't have to write much. This is a very nice summary. I have seen at least one that has three paragraphs of information for each of these boxes, which is great, but you don't have to that much. Um, from there, they have their list of all their service area goals and they're highlighted because these are the ones that they're focusing on to connect their service area outcomes to. And once again, they have X's there for students, for technology, and collegiate environment. Next, we're going to skip over to instructional programs. And I'm trying to bounce around just so everyone uh, can see some different options. Okay, so we're going to go to section two, which is competency, student learning outcomes, and assessment. This is really where, when people think about this process, what they think of is the student learning outcomes, or outcomes in general. We're gonna scroll down, and the first thing that you see is the narrative. So it says, state the intended student learning outcome. So students will be able to explain in writing various scientific concepts. Okay. So the program outcome is based off um, state the program outcome upon which the student learning outcome is based. So this is that one that appeared on that page before. So it says write clearly and accurately in a variety of contexts and format. And then they have plans on places that they're going to assess this. So these courses, you've got Bio 112, uh, Physics 152, Chemistry 152. And they're planning to do this every single spring. So it says state the means of assessment. They'll use current or revised capstone writing assignments in Bio 112 Physics 152 and Chemistry 152. Um, the assessment will be done by the QEP committee using the four C's rubric. And once again, uh, this is from last year, so I have a feeling this is going to change since MAP is our new QEP. 
Okay, so the target criteria for success is students, 70% of students will write a level of three or above. And this will be conducted every time the, the capstone course is taught. So from here, what happens is you include all of your information about whether or not you met your goal. And it's as basic as this. You can say, yes, 72% of my students met this goal or they did not. And so down here, you can see it was either met or not met. Um, this one, they did not close the loop, so we're going to have to look at the next one. But I also do want to mention that new in 2015, 2016, this is really important. This is very different from any other year. And if you don't remember anything from the session, this is the one thing I want you to remember. Okay, and that is that uh, we want you to show how you're closing the loop from last, using last year's data. So last year you, you said we're planning to do these things and we want to see what actually happened as far as this outcome. So next, we're going to head to student learning outcome number two. Let's see. I would like to skip over to ECD student learning outcomes number one. So from here, students are prepared for employment, yes. Uh, provide educational opportunities that enhance career development. They're going to do this twice a year with this class and they'll state the means of assessing is whether or not they get that certificate, that certification. So they want to see an increase in the number of students who earn at least the bronze level certificate of the career readiness certificate. So it's very clear. You can say yes or no, these students were able to do this. And so 85% of the students were able to do this, it was met. Um, so students will be able to complete, complete the marketplace because they were earned a credential indicating that students uh, possess foundational skills for various occupations. So the results will help the program to develop as a catalyst for economic development. Um, that's a, a great, that's a pretty good statement if you have met your outcome. But if you have not met your outcome, we want to see like, like plans of how are you going to change this in the future? Because it's easy to tweak something. I cannot remember the instructor um, at the moment, but there's an instructor I've spoken to recently and uh, they, instead of giving this giant uh, capstone project at the end of the class, they're giving it to their students a little bit at a time. So the student does a little, then they send it back to the instructor, the instructor evaluates it and sends it back. And they do this process so they can improve the final product at the end. Then there's another instructor that I've spoken to that said that they're planning on giving better instructions to their students when they, they give them the assignment because um, they felt like they miscommunicated that semester and it would have been better if they had framed it differently. So there are different ways that you can close the loop and make uh, things happen. So I'm gonna head back to the instructional one. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about quality and viability criteria. Basically with this, A through F, all of this information is actually put in there by IER for you all. But we would really like you to use it because you can look at that data in order to determine outcomes and determine changes that you want to make. Um, from there, the two sections that you would be responsibility, responsible for are the advisory committee updates. So you do want to include that information. So here is a date of an advisory committee meeting. They have key topics addressed their recommendations, action plans, or completed items in response to committee guidance, and then the number of organizations outside CCCC that attend um, advisory committee meetings. So one high school counselor represented, re representative and every high school in this service area was invited to send a representative. And I know for this program, for university transfer, they have also had um, sessions where they've been invited all four-year schools in the state to come and give them feedback on ways they can do it. So that's, that's very important. So we're not gonna talk about this today, but I'm sure you all know the budget requests are all there. And as a part of the budget request, do consider including your accomplishments and innovations. So this part is actually optional for you all, but it would be great to include that in there because it's a way that you, it provides information that you can take to your uh, supervisor during your evaluation to say, hey, this is what we accomplished this year, 
or uh, these are the new things that we're working on. And uh, Dean Byington actually gave me a really good suggestion the other day to tell you guys. And he says that he has, um, let's see, he has a notebook in his desk and every time someone walks into his office and tells him something wonderful happened, he takes out that notebook, writes it down, and then just sticks it back in the desk. And that's the only thing that notebook does, is records the wonderful things that people in his department have done. Because you can include all of that information right here when you write your um, outcomes and assessment report every year. And I do believe I heard that uh, Dr. Price will use the accomplishments and innovations to help make decisions about budgeting. So that's um, helpful as well. And the last, you do have your review, and this is where your dean, your vice president, whoever uh, reviews this for you will provide you feedback for your um, outcomes and assessment for that year. So I feel like that was a ton of information, right? So you all have any questions at this moment? If you have any questions going forward, let me know. Okay, so to recap what we've done today. We talked about assessment. Remember that IER focuses on program level and student learning outcomes assessment for instruction, uh, service outcomes for service areas, and administrative outcomes for ECD. Uh, remember the assessment cycle is uh, creating outcomes, gathering data, and then actually using that information. And remember using that information is the most important. From there, outcomes, just some main points. Remember, uh, choose action verbs from Bloom's taxonomy if you are in instruction areas. Um, outcomes must be measurable. If you can't measure them, you can tweak them a little bit or maybe look for different outcomes. And then last, your reviewer determines the number of outcomes that you need. And remember that at the very least, you do need three. And I'm going to send this to you all. This is just a reminder of uh, who is responsible for what sections. So these are the sections for instructional programs. This is who does it. And when it says program, that means the person actually filling out the compliance assist page. Is it required? Yes, optional, or no. This was recently taken out, the writing works, because it's our um, old community. And then last, just some notes to remind you. And that's the same for service areas, and it's the same for ECD.